Bienvenue. Welcome. Thank you everyone for coming to the 83rd event of Disrupting Disruptions, the Feminist and Accessible Publishing Communications and Technology Speaker and Workshop Series. I'm Dr. Alex Ketchum, and I'm a professor of feminist and social justice studies at McGill and the organizer of this series. The Feminist and Accessible Publishing, Communications, and Tech Speaker and Workshop Series seeks to bring together scholars, creators, and people in industry working at the intersections of digital humanities, computer science, feminist studies, disability studies, communication studies, LGBTQ studies, history, and critical race theory. So I'm so excited to welcome you all, for those of you who are online joining us, and also for all of you in this space. Uh, just to do kind of a plug, we have two other events upcoming this semester. So on Saturday, we have an LGBTQ plus book celebration from 6 to 8 p.m. at Le Guillon, the feminist queer bookstore. Um, just so you have a heads up, it's in a temporary location on Maisonneuve, just a block and a half from its regular Baudry location. Um, and on November 15th, Dr. Tamara Nice will speak about her new book, Death Glitch, How Techno-Solutionism Fails Us in This Life and Beyond. Um, and that'll be at 6 p.m. and um, will actually just be a virtual event. You can find our full schedule as well as video recordings of past events at disruptingdisruptions.com. That's the redirect URL. The other one's way too long to remember. It's disruptingdisruptions.com. Um, and you can also find our full list of sponsors, including Shirk, Milieu, Mila, Rikaf, and more. Tonight's event is co-sponsored by the Digs Lab. So do you want to sure. stuff? Oops. Um, hi, everyone. Housed at Concordia University and part of the Milieu Institute, the, Di the Digital Intimacy, Gender, and Sexuality Lab, aims to understand through empirical research, theory, and creative innovation, how digital media, digital technologies, and digital culture are shaping intimate relationships, gender, and sexuality. Dr. Dame Griff's work demonstrates the intricate relationship between gender identity and technologies, namely the internet past and present. So I'm really looking forward to hearing more about his research tonight. So um, for folks in person, obviously you can ask your questions in person when we get to the Q&A part. For folks joining us, joining us, sorry, for folks joining us on Zoom, we have a Q&A option available. So you'll find it at the bottom of your screens. And we can't guarantee that every question will be answered depending on how many people are here, but we'll do our best to answer them. And we're grateful for the discussion that you generate. Thank you also to our captioner for today, Michelle. So Michelle is writing these lovely captions right here. Um, as we welcome you into our home, as you welcome us into your homes or offices for the um, Zoom folks, and as we welcome you into the IGSF building, um, let us be mindful of space and place. As many of you know, past series speakers Suzanne Kite and Jess McLean have spoken about the impact of the technologies that we're using on the physical world. So the digital is always physical. While many of this, the events this semester are virtual or hybrid, everything that we do is tied to the land and the space that we are on. We must always be mindful of the lands that the servers enabling our virtual events are on and something to be thinking about as we're doing a history of technology today. Furthermore, as the series seeks to draw attention to power relations that have been invisibilized, it's important to acknowledge Canada's long colonial history and current political practices. So this series is affiliated with the Institute for Gender, Sexuality and Feminist Studies of McGill University. McGill is located in Djoge, Montreal, on unceded Ganyangahaga territory. Furthermore, as the organizing efforts by Indigenous communities, water protectors, and people involved in land back movements make clear the ever present and ongoing colonial violence in Canada, uh, we must always be mindful of the lands that we are on. Interwoven with this history of colonization is one of enslavement and racism. This university's namesake, James McGill, enslaved Black and Indigenous peoples, and it was from, in part, from the money he acquired through these violent acts that McGill University was founded. These histories are here with us in this space and inform the conversations that we have today. I encourage you to learn more about the lands that you are on and come from. NativeLand.ca is a fantastic resource for beginning. So now for today's events, I have the pleasure. I'm going to set, did you want to read the file? Are you sure? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> because I've been talking for a while. Okay, so now for today's event, Dr. Avery Dame Griff is a lecturer in women and gender studies at Gonzaga University. He founded and serves as primary curator of the Queer Digital History Project, QueerDigital.com, an independent community history project cataloging and archiving pre-2010 LGBTQ spaces online. It's a fantastic resource. Definitely check it out. 
In 2022, he was selected to be a public humanities fellow for Humanities Washington, developing a series of interactive online exhibits, teaching guides, and workshops about the history of LGBTQ plus communities and in online spaces. So please join us in welcoming Dr. Avery Dane Griff. On mute. All right. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, so in this talk, I'm going to be exploring several major themes in my book, sort of following them through a set of different historical moments that I kind of cover in it. And then at the end of it, I'm going to briefly essentially do a thing I didn't do in the book, which is consider the import of this in the contemporary moment. I'll also note, because of a lot of this history is American, I'm going to be thinking primarily in the American context, but I, we like in discussion, I'm going to talk about how this connects to the wider Anglosphere. Um, so the one sentence elevator pitch, I always sort of give it for the book, and now clicker where you work. There we go. It's basically that you can't get the current trans uh, movement without the internet. Uh, so to go into more detail though, in the two revolutions, I explore the historical forces that made this movement possible, as well as how trans individuals fit into this broader history of the internet. Uh, so in this talk, I'm going to be basically kind of tracing two major threads uh, that kind of wind their way through the book, essentially the two revolutions, uh, so to speak. The emergence of transgender as a shared political and community identity, uh, but also the family computer and the rise of the internet. So I'll begin, before we kind of get to that, talking through language change over time within trans communities to provide a little bit of historical context of how the movement toward transgender sort of started and how it, and essentially to set up how it kind of comes to spread through the platforms and moments I'll discuss a little later. All right, so in the mid 1980s, when the books begins, the most common term for trans folks is the gender community. Uh, it's primarily made up of two large groups and then sort of two smaller groups that tend to fall into crossdressers. So you have your heterosexual crossdressers and a rose. I was looking down and like doing this thing. I have to be friendly with you guys. <laughs> so, so primarily we have two groups. You have heterosexual cross-dressers who had an emotional and or erotic interest in performing femininity through dress and self-presentation. And you have transsexual individuals who sought to socially or medically transition from their sex assigned at birth. Uh, one thing to note, you kind of note throughout this talk in this history, one of the things is that transsexual men are absolutely around and are active. However, their presence is dwarfed by the presence of transsexual women within this history and within the community writ large. Um, so notably amongst this, folks are always so transgender, sort of like Virginia Prince, who's probably the most famous person to identify as such, uh, who do take HRT, but they don't desire any other medical interventions, and androgynous folks who use the term Andrew Gynes, uh, like Ariadne Kane. However, as I was sort of saying earlier, Basically, anyone who is not a transsexual tends to sort of get lumped under the crossdresser umbrella. So these two groups had in that time really uneasy alliance, unified by their similar cross-gender interests and desires, but also uncomfortable with the implied associations uh, of this alliance. So first, some heterosexual crossdressers, uh, particularly married ones, feared the proximity to transsexuals might make their spouses worry that they really wanted to transition. And I should note, some of them eventually did. Uh, it was more of a perception that cross-dressing was this automatic first step toward transition. Second, transsexuals uh, worried that associating with cross-dressers who didn't have this sort of stable cross-sex identification might diminish their chances of passing and make them seem like they were sort of playing with their identity. So, we have all these folks together, and then by the late 1980s, there's this increasing interest within the community in creating an apparatus for large-scale political organizing. However, at this moment, as they're starting to think about what would it mean to build a national level nonprofit in the United States, community members are also sort of realizing that while gender's vagueness renders it functional, it sort of passes under the radar for folks who don't know what it means, uh, it's not exactly the most persuasive political identity. Thus launches this sort of ongoing search for a new collective term. So several different ones are proposed. Uh, Virginia Prince proposes by gender all, uh, which I should note uh, was almost immediately critiqued that it would be read as a, a big ender. 
Um, Ariadne Cain uh, suggests conscious gender community, which honestly is just a giant mouthful. Um, but the term that sticks is repurposing transgender. Um, sort of like Leslie Feinberg famously proposes this uh, and as well, so some of this draws from Holly Boswell. Ultimately though, like I said, repurposing transgender as an umbrella term is sort of what wins out. Uh, early on, often this adjectival form, transgender, that is sort of less in favor now. Uh, these folks have highlight transgender's extensive possibilities. Compared to gender community, transgender clearly signals individuals shared cross-gender affinity and experiences with oppression, while also decentering the power of medical authority to sort trans experience into, again, one of these two diagnostic buckets, simply because the ideas of cross-dressing and transsexuality come out of these sort of original medical diagnoses. <clears throat> However, this idea of proposing transgender is essentially just a first step. The real challenge is actually encouraging widespread adoption. This is where digital communications and the internet came in. So before we sort of get to the point in the mid 90s where we start to adopt transgender, we have to discuss how trans folks get online in the first place. Uh, so it's important to note that folks in the mid 80s had a very different relationship to computers than we do now. Uh, though personal computers, what were known as microcomputers at the time, were becoming more common, uh, they were by no means ubiquitous. So the popular image of the computer is probably best represented by the 1984 film War Games. Uh, yes, only some of you are old enough to remember the dude you're getting a Dell commercial. Um, and so the computer is seen as this technical tool for business and bureaucracy, but it's the realm of hackers and geeks. And then by the mid 1980s, there are several different ways for computer owners to communicate. Uh, the most visible to the American public are these sort of commercial services, uh, like CompuServe or Prodigy, or Genie or QLink, which would eventually go on to become America Online. All of these are sort of what's known as walled gardens. They offered a lot of stuff within their services, but they had very limited connections outside of those networks. And while there are trans spaces on all these services, and we'll return to these in a sec, uh, we know a lot less about what was on here than we do know about bulletin board systems. Uh, these are the sort of scrappier independent alternatives. Uh, so this is a photo of a BBS here. Uh, it's from around 1982. Uh, as you can sort of tell, it's just basically one microcomputer system. It's got a modem up top, and then it's got a couple of like external hard drives. Um, so for using a BBS, this lays out basically the basic process. This graphic has existed for years on the internet. I have no idea who created it, but it's a perfect explanation. You have your computer with your modem. You dial the phone number for the BBS. Using your telephone line, you dial in. And the auto dialer modem on the BBS picks up. And if there's a line available, you connect to the BBS. If not, you wait until a line is available, like you dial back in until you can get connected. Uh, and in practical terms, the BBS is essentially just a server that has lots of different functions. You can chat, you can send and receive email, you can access files that they host. Basically, a lot of the stuff we find on social media kind of starts with the BBS. Uh, so in January 1st, 1984, the first BBS for the gender community, GenderNet, goes live. By 1985, GenderNet sponsoring organization, the Gateway Gender Alliance, proudly claimed to have more calls than we ever anticipated, 402 within a 15-day period. And just as a heads up, we're about to have uh, some slightly censored nudity. Uh, one of GenderNet's callers was journalist Robert E. Carr, <clears throat> who included the BBS in his March 1985 Playboy article, Type Dirty to Me. I just, this art is so classically 80s. Um, I always use it. In this article, Carr expresses surprise at witnessing an incredible statistic, multiple transsexuals in one place. Uh, to Carr, GenderNet presented an irresistible opportunity after all, he notes in his article, how many transsexuals do you know who own computers? One, two, three at the most, right. Now, based on the GGA's numbers, however, there were certainly more than three. Well, GenderNet wouldn't last past 1986 when the Gateway Gender Alliance dissolved. Its success served as proof of concept for a variety of individuals within the gender community. So throughout the late 1980s, uh, more BBS is specifically targeted at the gender community launch. 
uh, some of which I've listed here. And listings for trans-specific BBSs start to appear in TBTS tapestry uh, in starting in 1988, and they get their own section by 1990. Uh, it's worth noting, sort of, I don't know if this, TBTS tapestry is basically anything that's kind of the public square of the community for many, many years. It's the most prominent magazine. Uh, at most, they think the circulation part reached about 10,000. Um, so sort of if something was happening, it would be in tapestry. And also regular BBSers were quick to recognize the format's potential. Uh, writing in the inaugural said, spring 91 issue of Chrysalis Quarterly, author Stephanie Rose uh, notes that the gender community was in the midst of two revolutions. I did not come up with this concept myself. Uh, the overt development of the shared political consciousness and the covert computer revolution from which they quote, stood to gain more than any other groups out there. Finding and talking to others like ourselves gives us strength, Rose argued. We feel more comfortable when we know we are not alone. The message sections of BBSs give us that sense of community. And politically minded members of the community embrace the technology. Uh, so the Sunday Society was one of the earliest organizations to promote the BBS as a political tool. They were founded in 88 as an offshoot of the Chicago Gender Society, specifically focused on the needs of transsexuals. So the sort of central focus of the Sunday Society early on is developing this network, the United Sisterhood of Transsexual Outreach Organizations, or US2. Uh, they initially conceive of it as, it's unclear, it sort of seems like maybe it's gonna be a network of micro computers connected by modems, and that does not work. So they transition it to a BBS in 89, but they keep the name for it. So in their inaugural newsletter, an unnamed author, it's likely one of the group's two founders, presents us to as a way to overcome existing technology's limitation and unite users as part of a larger movement. She compares it to the existing grapevine, where information and support were spread unevenly amongst its many branches. Uh, whereas a computer network was a far more sustainable distribution system, as information could be quickly and evenly spread amongst its many nodes. When promoting this project to other groups, like ads like this, which ran in other uh, groups' newsletters. <clears throat> the organization urges readers to imagine a future where they are, again, quote, uniting ourselves in one of the most important causes in our lives. So in a later October 89 column, Sunday Society co-founder, Louise O'Raylor, she leans heavily on this kind of techno-utopian rhetoric to emphasize us to revolutionary possibilities. And really ideally to encourage reader involvement from folks in the area. So she compares us to, to launching a Saturn V rocket. This moment when quote, science fiction became science fact and fantasy became reality. Through the many, the hard work of quote, many years of planning, experimenting and testing by many sincerely dedicated individuals. You can sort of hear like the music swelling in the background of this. It's like now, some 20 years later, a new mission is underway. And I'm sort of quoting from right back here. And like the Apollo program, launching us two will be an equally difficult and rewarding endeavor. Using language from quintessentially techno utopian franchise Star Trek, Raider framed transsexuals seeking transition as explorers of a final frontier, the ultimate congruity of post transition life, where no man or woman has gone before. So for these explorers, us two is this opportunity to not only solve one of our greatest obstacles, the communication gap in our community, but also make history and forever change the way our community is considered by others. So she ends her column with this challenge to readers that I have there with us. Whether we have a smooth lift off or blow up on the pad will be up to all of us. All systems are go on this end. How about you? So it's unclear how successful us two actually was, Raider's rhetoric invites readers to imagine a radically different potential future where computer communication inaugurates these new imaginative possibilities, including a visible politically active community. Even as folks like Rose or Raider argue for their radical future potential, the number of actual BBS users made up a relatively small portion of the wider gender community. Non-technical community members presented BBSing as a technical endeavor for the computer literate who knew the lingo or in one evocative term of phrase, the hackers in our community. Everything you are always a hacker if you use a computer. 
Uh, as with the rest of America, however, the computer illiterate of the gender mute community would ride the dot-com bubble to replace branding itself as the internet and a whole lot more, America Online. But if these folks are gonna get online, the first thing you need is a computer. So starting in the mid eighties, home computer ownership began growing exponentially in America. As the computer is shifting from being seen solely a technical tool for white collar work to something more akin to a domestic appliance. Uh, so in 94, a National Telecommunications and Information Administration Survey, so I'll say NTIA, uh, finds 50% of households making at least $50,000 US, uh, roughly 94,000 in about 2021, had a computer and modem at home. And that figure jumped to 60% by 1997. You can see in the chart right here on the left. Uh, and you can, like I said, see the growth depicted here. Uh, this is coming from a 1998 NTIA report. Notably, both race and economic class are also key factors in early computer adoption rates. So from this, we can intuit that early on, especially, access was limited to mostly white, middle and upper class homes. Notably, however, increasing demand for PCs drove the growing direct to consumer market led by in the US companies like Dell or Gateway with its iconic CalPrint branded boxes. Uh, so instead of focusing on technical specs, these companies really frame the PC as this kind of customizable appliance that you could purchase outright, or similar to say a home appliance or furniture, you can get on credit and pay off in monthly installments. There's not good statistics about the popularity of using financing to purchase a computer, but it's likely this approach really opens up ownership to a lot of the folks who might not have otherwise been able to afford it at the time. So by 98, a Pew study found that 41% of all, oh, I forgot my slides are backwards. Nope, I'm missing a slide. All right, anyway. By 98, a Pew study found that 41% of all adult respondents were using the internet, up from 36% in 97 and 23. So we see that we have increasing adults. So this change marks the beginning of the era of the family computer, which was usually located in a shared space, uh, like the living or family room, where different family members could access it when they need it. So I promise this is my first time doing it. I'm working out all the kinks on the fly. I apologize. This is my home computer in 1995. I have no idea why my dad took this photo. <laughs> I have it. He, there's like uh, multiples of these and he scanned them. I was like, why? It's like, I don't remember. It was 1995. Um, but I mentioned this because my father was a systems administrator. I grew up around computers all my life. But I was unusual that he had his work computer and I got his hand me down. And I also had internet much earlier than a lot of my peers because he needed it for work. Um, so if this is in 1995, this exact same year, we have a sudden interest in computing that is sort of accompanied by what I call like a network fever that overtakes media. So you have films like The Net and Hackers that really show this particular kind of image of highly visual and stylized vision of the possibilities of a new electronic frontier. Um, I didn't want to put two GIFs in here, but I thought about putting the pizza.net ordering GIF from the net, uh, which is my favorite weird time capsule from that movie. And so these early majority adopters, who were not amongst the hackers in the community, were more likely to sort of get wired if they're getting a kind of essentially family computer uh, using one of those major services from earlier. And notably, trans individuals had presences on all of these platforms. Uh, so each of these services had their own user culture and norms, as well as access restrictions. So both Genie, which was owned by General Electric, uh, and Genderline on Sys or CompuServe, they required special permission to join. While the trans, trans chat room on no, trans chat room on AOL was for many years a transient space. It was forced to close and reopen based on moderators' whims, and I'll come back to this in a second. Yet all of these spaces existence was contingent on the continued goodwill of corporate hosts. The presence of such possibly adult material appeared to some to contradict platforms family friendly images, uh, as seen in this 96 AOL commercial emphasizing the services kid friendly aspects. Uh, as you can see a variety of sort of peppy middle class children use AOL to get homework help. They go online, they visit the White House website. Um, that kid just like rocking out on his headphones. <laughs> I have to wait. All right. So, 
then part of this imagery was also likely spurred by the cyber porn panic of the mid 90s. Uh, so during this period, news media are just filled with stories such as this infamous July 95 time cover story with this infamous cover <laughs> discussing the danger this novel new medium posed to young children. Many authors, they use these anecdotal stories to highlight their net's risks. So in this Time Magazine piece, for example, the author Philip Elmer DeWitt cites the experience of 10-year-old Anders Ermacher, who was emailed a file filled with photos of, quote, a couple is engaged in various acts of sodomy, heterosexual intercourse, and lesbian sex. Most often, these stories emphasize this child subject, yeah, child subject's innocence. So Elmer DeWitt notes that Ermacher hangs out a lot in Abel's kid-specific treehouse chat room and parental outrage, as we can see in this quote from Ermacher's shocked mother. Uh, so in this environment, trans individuals' wider association with pornography made them vulnerable to efforts challenging their right to convene in public online. So this is most directly apparent in this 93 Washington Post piece that was sort of widely syndicated across newspapers. Uh, this has all the hallmarks of a kind of classic cyber porn panic story. You got an innocent child, you have a pornographic topic, transvestites, and an evocative stinger quote from Genevieve Kasdan. She was thinking in all innocence, we're going to talk about Barney. Um, this introduction serves, as the piece's author says, as an example of how users were now exposed to, quote, some of the raunchier aspects of human life. Absent, of course, from the story is the voice of the transvestites active within TV chat, which was a well-known trans chat support room. For while authors no doubt imagine these spaces were salacious dens of iniquity, they were in practice more akin to a social club or a support group. In fact, trans users and trans spaces implicitly or explicitly discourage discussion of adult topics. This informal ban had long been part of a larger push by trans organizations uh, and cross-dressing organizations in particular to gain mainstream respectability. Of course, these moves had no impact on AOL's corporate terms of service, uh, which for many years maintained that both transsexual and transvestite were vulgar language that when used in, quote, email, chat, message boards, or instant messages violated AOL's terms of service. So in effect, this means that any mention of trans or trans-adjacent topics can lead to a permanent ban from AOL. Uh, as a result, the first trans chat rooms on AOL, which begin in 1901, are coded as gender discussion. They're held in small private rooms capped to 24 people. So they would allow this language as long as it was private, but you had to know the person to be allowed to access it, so random people couldn't run across it. However, within the first year, the room was regularly at capacity. Uh, they would eventually arrange to use the Gay and Lesbian Community Forum's larger chat room once a week to meet. Uh, even so, this publicness using the Gay and Lesbian Conference Room did mean, meant users could no longer use the vulgar language without fearing possible censure from roving AOL moderators. So most members continue to lean really heavily on gender as an umbrella stand-in, or these other sort of vague terms like Friends of Virginia, similar to Friends of Dorothy, but Virginia being Virginia Prince. Ultimately, AOL's terms of service were, according to AOL regular Gwendolyn Ann Smith, uh, will reappear in the story in a second, uh, they were a form of erasure and delegitimizing. As if to say the only reason when we need to talk about trans issues was for a sexually deviant reason. We were not seen as humans who simply wanted to come together to discuss our interests, no matter how mundane they might be. We were simply not welcome to be. So following a particularly aggressive campaign to close trans-related chat rooms in late 93, early 94, users began a concerted letter writing campaign protest AOL's policy. No one wants to say letter, but mostly actually emails. Um, so this campaign marks a distinct change of tactics for trans AOL users. Though, <clears throat> though both groups were nominally part of the gender community, transsexual and cross-dressing users differing needs represent a ma major hurdle to them successfully cooperating. Yet the non-specificity of TOS enforcement meant all of them were targeted equally and their shared discrimination necessitates a united front. Notably, campaigners also called on allies, such as leadership within the GLCF, to get involved as well. However, trans AOL community leaders increasing association with gay and lesbian organizations 
didn't sit well with some heterosexual cross-dressers who strongly opposed any connection with gay or lesbian individuals for fear would mark them as gay. And they actually initially opposed even using the GLCF conference room at all. Trans leadership, in contrast, saw the GLCF's identity collective model as one they could emulate for themselves. So in this undated letter published while the campaign is ongoing, the moderator sort of creates the first gender room, Melanie Ann Phillips, and she sort of leads this campaign and is the primary point of contact with AOL. Uh, she argues that gay and lesbian users have used their niche as a base to grow and lobby for a home of their own once they're a large enough force online. So with our history of growth on AOL as a community, it seemed to her the best way to accomplish getting acceptance and our own forum is to keep adding services for increasing membership until we too are a force big enough to be recognized. So she closes this letter urging everyone in the gender community to spend at least some of their online time here thereby contributing to our political cloud and ultimately a form of our own. This call to spend time there was in essence a request for trans users to put their money back into trans-oriented services. And a part of this is about how AOL works at the time. Prior to 96, sort of thing, prior to the um, rise of the World Wide Web, AOL users are charged hourly fees. You prepay for so many hours and then everything else you pay by the hour. In different forums, all of which, including the GLCF, are run by independent contractors. They are not run by AOL. We're granted increased space and support from AOL based on their churn rate, or how many users visited and how long they stayed online in specific contractors' forums or chat rooms. So by spending time in the trans areas of the GLCF, trans users would show that they were a low churn population worth investing in. Basically, we spend a lot of money here. Wouldn't you like to have us spend more money? Uh, as such, Philip is asking users to see themselves as this collective consumer block whose spending habits push AOL to reconsider their position on trans individuals' presence on the service. So throughout this entire campaign, AOL offers no official response until mid-94, when letter writers received a mass mailed email, essentially as people tell it, out of the blue. Uh, notifying them that trans discussions are now allowed, quote, as long as they conform to terms of service. So as Phillips predicted, trans users' presence following this policy change grows rapidly throughout 94 into 95, when the official Transgender Community Forum, or TCF, opens within the Gay and Lesbian Community Forum, and this is overseen by Gwendolyn Ann Smith. By this point, Phillips has sort of retreated from organizing this, she's sort of moved on to other parts of her life. Um, so she doesn't ever really, really reappear in the history very well. Notably, the choice to use transgender instead of gender reflects the shifting political winds within the community, where transgender is steadily picking up steam as a community's public-facing identity. In some ways, this kind of collective, not unlike the gay and lesbian groups, Phillips pointed to for inspiration. This term is increasingly used by major community organizations, most notably tapestry which changed their name from TVTS to Transgender Tapestry the same year that the TCF was launched. So as the term's visibility grows, it becomes the default identity, <clears throat> a way to find others like you online. So in this 1997 article on the Transgender Community Forum, the story from the sort of eponymous jokestress uh, gives you a sense of the term's importance. With just the word transgender, she's almost immediately able to talk to other trans folks. All she needs is the word, it takes her right to the place. So by the early 2000s, transgender is almost universally adopted by major community organizations. This is a part that I can't really get into. There's like a whole push within the community to sort of train people to start to use it and apply it. Um, and soon a new portion of that population who'd otherwise rarely been seen is now using the term to self-identify, trans youth. So as the tale of the transgender community forum illustrates, the presence of youth online raises a variety of challenging questions for the gender community. Clinton era rhetoric very much reinforced the idea that access to the computers and the resources of the quote unquote information superhighway were essential for young Americans' future success. And they certainly found their way online, though I don't have good statistics of minors' computer use during this period. Um, what I do have from Pew, like 70% of 18 to 29 year olds surveyed in 97 
uh, by Pew said they were regular internet users. And by 2005, this number has increased to 83. And some of these youth happen to be trans. Because uh, the rise of trans youth as a recognizable demographic represents a major change for a community that had long been very hesitant to interact with legal minors. Uh, for example, a uh, prominent trans publisher, Kimberly Richards, who she's around for the 90s and then sort of vanishes at the very end of the 90s. Um, I never really tracked her down. But she writes in this 1994 column that she felt uncomfortable just doing informal phone counseling with trans youth without a doctor or nurse on the line, lest the call become, quote, quote, a potentially dangerous situation should the teen's parents feel that she was contributing to the delinquency of a minor. You can see in this quote also over here at the left, for groups that do allow minors, say it's Moose Sigma in Arkansas, it's like a whole process you had to approve. And the parent was involved at every step of the way. So at the end of this column from 94, Richards concludes that she, quote, honestly didn't know if there was anything trans organizations could do for youth. And admitted she, quote, wouldn't sleep well with that admission. Even though she worried about teens she'd spoken to, Richards hoped a new technology that she herself often championed might prove an important source of support, the internet. Because while Richards is writing in 94, trans youth have always been present if fleetingly in digital trans spaces since 88. So on the trans-specific CD form email mailing list, which if you're at ASA, I'll be presenting on, on Saturday, uh, trans youth, many of whom first got connected through their universities, uh, we're able to ask questions and learn how to safely explore their cross-gender feelings and find supportive therapists and basically grow their networks. However, all of these trans youth are almost entirely interacting with trans adults. Furthermore, the pool of youth with net access is super limited at this time. Again, if you are on a mailing list, you are likely at a university. And for almost everybody who is a trans youth who posts, I'm saying youth is basically like a 19 to 21, almost every single one of them starts it with, Hi, I'm a computer science major. <laughs> so clearly they come from a very specific population. Uh, so for trans youth born in the mid to late 1980s, which I am one though, uh, they grew up around personal computers, either at home or at school or both. Uh, and for them, the internet seems like this super obvious source of information and social outlet. You know, so they connect to a variety of resources through so IRC chat, uh, AIM instant messenger, or message boards. Oh, these I did. I am old now. Um, mm -hmm. However, many of these formats are relatively ephemeral and they leave behind few archival traces. Only one format is extensively archived the homepage. So during the late 1990s into the early 2000s, ad supported web hosting services like GeoCities allow users to create their own websites or homepages that features a variety of personalized content from hobbies and fandoms to photo collections and journals. So compared with the text heavy format like CD forum, homepages are vibrant, uh, sometimes too vibrant to our mm -hmm. taste now. Uh, most homepage creators decorate their places as you might their bedrooms. They have array of colors, typefaces, embedded music files, my God, embedded <laughs> videos, uh, and animated GIFs, so many animated GIFs. Uh, there, these are just kind of like a few examples. Effectively, we can think of the homepage as this early precursor to what we get from sort of the social media profile, the hyper-personalization. And these homepage owners could connect through web rooms or directories, which link sites together through their shared membership. Uh, so the most extensively archived of these is the Transgender Teen Web Directory. Created in 98, it was last archived in 2002. It has includes links, homepages, and email addresses uh, for youth members from 32 different states and eight other countries. So out there of the US, basically. So these homepages have a variety of information. They had advice to coming out, navigating coming out in high school, pursuing medical transition as a teen in the early 2000s. Uh, for example, transgender teen directory founder, Sarah, uh, her diary, which runs from 97 to 2001, she includes repeated references to her ongoing email communication with other trans teens. They sort of help her navigate her self-identity, coming out to her parents, building connections within her community. Some youth use their homepages to share their coming out letters with their parents, or even as a primary venue for coming out. So in the case of Sarah, she posts her letters to her website, but she also makes their home browser. This is the homepage that loads. When the browser loads, that's how she comes out to her parents. The minute they go to the internet, they see her coming out. Alternately, some 
trans youth were outed by their home pages. 14 year old Jennifer describes how after her mom walks in on her and reads her home page as she slept, she was down to quote, martial law. So, and I don't have her original page. What is archived is the raw code of the page. Um, so that's sort of why it looks like this. Uh, she has this addendum she's added later on. Mom, if you're reading this, let me be who I want to be. It's very classic 14 year old teen. Um, several teens outed by their pages reported having their computer and internet access severely restricted, which is a reminder of their limited autonomy in this era of the shared family computer which again, for many of these, this is the primary way they access the internet. And notably, trans youth also recognize their site's impact on readers. And many made a point to note that their sites were by teens for teens. So for Dylan Matthew, this is his site here, one of the key inspirations in making his homepage was his belief that, quote, it's important for other trans kids to be able to run across people like themselves. I always find myself wanting to look at pictures and read journals written by fellow transgender teens. So I'm going to try to produce the same sort of thing I think it's stumbling upon. I'm also keeping up these pages because I think it helps a person to share some of himself with the world, even if only via the internet. Reading this quote now, when platforms incentivize sharing is just another mode of monetization, its core sentiment can seem a little quaint. Uh, but given how otherwise invisible trans youth were in public life, being able to see homepages by and for other youth is a revolutionary change. Unlike Richard's really tenuous phone calls, parental consent and approval weren't always a prerequisite for talking to other trans folks online. In fact, as the example from Jennifer's page highlights, some youth embraced a trans identity despite parental approval. And for youth who didn't live in big metro centers with established queer youth groups, these pages and the connections they established could be a lifeline. The speed and reach of digital communications allow youth all over the country to develop a specific shared identity, not just as teens who happen to be trans, but as a growing demographic subset of the wider trans community. Through these online spaces, what had once seemed rare, publicly identifying as trans before you reach your 30s, is rapidly becoming a common shared experience for many. And so to sort of bring this back where we started, Notably, these youth had always self-identified as transgender. The internet has so effectively and rapidly spread this term, that they likely never knew anything different existed. Uh, moreover, many of them understood transgender as both a personal and a political identity, part of what we now call the LGBTQ umbrella. Now, youth are more likely than ever to identify as transgender. As you can see, these statistics are from the UCLA's Williams Institute, uh, it's from a 2022 report. Uh, yet in the current moment, they repeatedly encounter rhetoric deeming their self-identity a fad, the result of social contagion, or a case of rapid onset gender dysphoria, a thing that is not real. Um, they also face an onslaught of legislation that is attempting to write them out of existence. And then the one place where they can find each other, social media, can vacillate between either moderating their content out of existence or refusing to protect them altogether. All of these trends together strip them of their agency and tell them you should not exist. You cannot exist. But I believe there's something history can do in this moment. By way of example, I have a story. So I teach a class on trans social movements at Gonzaga University. Uh, in it, students explore the trans youth homepages I just described. I have them look at it in class. Now, I've looked at these pages a lot, but they are the ones that caught that one of the homepage groups. This is a different young woman named Jennifer. Um, she started at Gonzaga GU as a freshman in 2000. And as they explore her homepage more, I have this young trans woman. She raises her hand really hesitantly, and she's like, turns out, she's like, I'm also a freshman at GU. I'm the exact same age. I'm also from the same place in Colorado. She has this like moment. And as she's saying this, I watch all the students' perspective shift from seeing these as individuals. These are historical actors in our guide whose lives have very few intersections with their own to approaching this topic with a sense of historical wonder. What had it been like for this young trans person to be at GU in 2000? How would their Catholic Jesuit university and its institutions have reacted then as compared to now? 
Uh, spoiler alert, not great. Um, but most importantly though, Jennifer's homepage gives the students a sense of her own place within trans history, especially when she reflected on it later in writings. More so than any other archival documents we looked at in the course. In Jennifer's page, this student could see part of her life represented in the archive. She could see how she fit because there was someone like her who came before. I think this is what this history can do. It can remind us that we've always been here and no amount of legislation barring our care or content moderation penalizing our presence will make us go away. Thank you. For a sec. So thank you so much for that amazing talk. I know that there's probably so many questions percolating in the audience. So for audience questions, Dr. Avery Nickriff will repeat the questions just so the Zoom people can hear. For people joining us on Zoom, I highly encourage you to write your question in the Q&A box and we will read it aloud for you. So thank you so much for folks online and offline for your questions. So we'll get the Q&A period started. Okay, I'll be more shy. I'll ask you so we can just get started. And then hopefully folks mm -hmm. warm up. So I'm hoping you can talk a little bit more about your methods and mm -hmm. some of your archival work mm -hmm. and kind of where you found some of these sources, both the um, digital mm -hmm. archival stuff and mm -hmm. also um, some of the physical materials. It's funny doing this, it's I talk about in the beginning of the book that uh, a lot of the early stuff actually is print, because sort of because some of this stuff is so ephemeral, the reason I have messages from these periods are information. So where I'm kind of finding this stuff was because folks who wrote newsletters, because it was a highly active community of newsletter writers during this period in the early days. This is sort of the height of print culture within the gender community. These newsletter editors, it was a tough job. They didn't have a lot of stuff in it. And they, but many of them were technical. They did this with computers, they were connected. And so they'd be like, oh, I have two pages. I can just get stuff off the BBS and just print it. So they would just like fill it up with stuff they yanked from now think was the internet. They just reprint the internet because they were like, I can't fill it up. There, it's that or two pages full of like clip art, which some of them legitimately did. They'd just be like, here, it's two pages of clip art. I don't have anything else. Um, so part of it is like, it would be reproduced in the archive and that would sort of give you the traces of what the thing was. Um, or like in some cases they'll, say a groups would often print like so-and-so as a new homepage. So they'd print their GOCA's address and be really proud of it. Like, look at Jennifer's new page. And then that, you can put that into the Wayback Machine and that was a way to sort of trace it. Was sort of like things would be kept, caught in print and then you can sort of trace them through what we have. Um, otherwise like other digital sources has just been like, what other limited archives exist? So looking at it. Um, shareware files, which were basically a lot of shareware during this period was various sort of things that were floating around digitally, but were during a period where it's really expensive to download, like large files. You, how you make your money, you put them on a CD, you charge 20 bucks for your CD. You're like, here, here is a bunch of stuff from the internet for 20 bucks. And so, but that means because these were then preserved by folks like Jason Scott, the internet archive, all that stuff is still there. Um, so it's just like digging through and like knowing words or knowing phone numbers. I call it in the beginning like rabbit holing. You start with the thing and then you just drill down and follow it where it goes until like at some point something will come out. Um, but yeah, like a lot of it early on, like the archival source is just like it's print and then that print connects you into the digital. Um, and then like until you get to the web, especially like when you get to the homepages, a lot of there's really otherwise there's not a lot of digital material for that period. Amazing, amazing. Even online questions like same in the room. Okay, I'll I'll read up the online. Um I'm just gonna unmute for this sec. So our online question from Ephraim. Sorry if I mispronounced your name. Is what would you say is the path to combating current attempts to legislate us out of online spaces? Oh, that's a big old question. Um, I think this is the thing I argue at the end of the book. I think we have to own it. That is what I've come down to. At the end of the book, I um, 
Now I still stand by this is I sort of, I talk about the ways in which sort of like trans publications and trans owned spaces sort of fall off in the era of like platforms. A particular look at the way in which trans print publications essentially tapestry ends the same year as Tumblr gets a million users. And this is not to say that tapestry should have existed forever, but it talks about the way in which the winds are shifting. Um, thing is like, as we learned from uh, Nipplegate, we don't own that. That there's a corporation that owns that and they can make these decisions absent of trans users' needs. And so at the end, I proposed basically what would it be like to have a model of something similar to something such as Archive of Our Own, which comes out of a similar move to remove fan content from live journal. And so the rallying cry from that period is we need to own the goddamn servers. And so that's why they start founding Archive of Our Own and the nonprofit that supports it, the organization of transformative works, so that they can own it. And I think the only way to do it is like, we have to own it. If we don't own it, someone can kick us off. Someone can cut us off. I know like, and there are ways also to create, but what are sustainable financial models beyond the sort of ad supported model? Is it a co-op model? Is there something else? Whatever it is, we have to own it because we are always a problem for a company at some point. We being queer users writ large. We always have been and we always will be because we are not always advertiser friendly. So it's just, we have to own it. If we own it, we are in control of it. And also if we wanna fight back against arguments of censorship, that means we also control our platform from which we speak and we cannot be silenced from it in the same way that you can be silenced on a corporate platform. Thank you. Thanks, you have another online one, but. <laughs> Hi, uh, thank you for that presentation. Um, so I, I found this account of how mm. transgender people um, built community um, through online spaces super fascinating. And I'm wondering sort of if if you consider that um, that the, that these practices of community building mm. um, sort of contributed to um, greater practices um, of online community building beyond the transgender mm -hmm. community like were, were these communities innovators in the space of how the internet mm -hmm. became used and developed in a in a greater way I, I would say in terms of like as trans communities as innovators within the space absolutely in the same way that like I often joke that like fandom and trans folks have sort of followed very very similar paths in how they have used and experienced the internet. And both of them sort of innovated in how they thought about it. Um, in the same way that like, when strike through happens on live journal, um, which is to say that was when a bunch of folks were banned. Uh, you can Google it if you really want to know more. Um, but that is the exact same moment when trans users who've been very active on live journal break off entirely and head for Tumblr at the same moment fandom does. Um, so it's sort of like, so these things have always sort of run on parallel tracks, like essentially communities that didn't have other spaces that were very invested in producing media have run in these similar paths. For LGB groups, it's been a little different because there was more sort of like corporate acceptance. At some point that stuff for trans folks kind of starts to merge a bit um, because once you get the initialism, uh, which I wish there was a history written because I still am not clear at what point we all launch into having the alphabet soup. Um, but which is not to speak ill of it, but you know, at some point suddenly we're a part of again a soup and not just a thing. Um, so where that merges and that becomes sort of more possibly corporate friendly, uh, but so they've largely run on kind of like these parallel tracks. So fandom in particular, and also like sometimes groups you wouldn't think of as innovators. Um, in the very beginning, when I'm talking about BBSs and political use of them, I use quotes from frankly white supremacist BBSs. Because white supremacists very early on recognized the potential as a group whose speech had rightly uh, been shuttered and shoved out of like public discourse, recognized how much more reach it gave them. So, like, for example, one of the things that white supremacists were super excited about BBSs in the 80s uh, was that they could get Mein Kampf into Canada because they could get it past the border control because it was going on telephone lines, it wasn't going in through customs. Um, so like they were very excited about this, uh, and like they also 
And like often to kind of illustrate this, I include a quote from a researcher at a progressive organization in the US who in the 80s talks about going and giving talks about this stuff to like, I guess, political organizations. And he brings a modem and a printer and a computer and he dials into one of these white supremacist BBSs and he just starts the printer going. It just prints and prints and prints. And then he, when people leave, he's like, here, do you want a couple of feet of white supremacist like writing? Cause you can have it. And the idea is to make this stuff very physical and visible about the need for political communication. Um, so it's the thing, cause you sort of like, look at all this stuff. You think you can't get it, look at here it is. Um, and so I think this thing, anybody who's, especially speeches have been suppressed or pushed out, have taken advantage of it. Some of it for good and some of it for not so good, shall we say? Well, there, there's another online one that said in the room question. Okay, I'm going to unmute to ask the online. So this question comes from Chris, who said that Chris has really enjoyed reading your book, so isn't sure if you answer this in the book, but writes, it's really fascinating to me how trans newsletter culture slowly moved online, but continued to exist and interact with internet communities. Do you have a sense of when that stopped or rather their functions diverged enough for the newsletters to stop publishing? So I'll, I will tell you, Chris, when you get to chapter five, that is when this will happen. <laughs> um, because this is why I do this in my time, talk about trans youth and then I leap into the future. So one of the things about trans youth, this is kind of what I talk about in chapter five, is that we have this big newsletter culture, which is very much more associated with this, what was the gender community, basically the folks who were part of that. These are folks who are like, usually middle-aged or older they are from they are basically born in the 70s or earlier for lack of a better way to put it um they are really attached to this newsletter culture they've been really involved in it but some of them start to sound the alarm that they're like people aren't coming to meetings people aren't participating with their so i extensively look at the archive of an organization in san antonio texas called bolton and park who are very anti-internet and, but they had been around for years. They ran what was known as a Texas Tea Party, um, which was a, essentially an annual conference in Texas um, for primarily cross-dressers and their spouses. Um, so they've been, they were heavily involved. They appeared on talk shows. Um, and so they talk about, they're like, each month we get fewer and fewer newsletters. We hear from fewer and fewer people. And they point straight to the internet. The people are going online, they're not coming to those groups, they're not really engaging with newsletters, they're not contributing. And so you sort of see like this particular decline, but at the same time, you're also seeing, I call it like a generation change. There are younger folks coming out as trans, and they also notably think about gender differently. Um, they, like I said, they always thought of themselves as transgender. They don't have the same discomfort with being associated with gay and lesbian groups that sort of like members of the older gender community are still very iffy about this. That is not a problem for them. They don't see these as different interests. So you sort of the decline of one and like the rise of the other. And this is not to say that one is better than the other, but there is also something I kind of point to that you lose because all of these other individuals, they've built up this infrastructure, massive like infrastructure of organizations and newsletters and conferences and mailing lists and basically all the apparatus you need to have a political movement. And so as people are not participating in that political apparatus, like the wheels slowly start to come off of it uh, and it kind of falls apart. And so that's sort of like newsletter culture is a part of that. Like the wheels fall off all of it and then everything's online, which is great for reach and great for kind of making things visible. But for when say you need to engage in a political campaign, you've got to do outreach, you've got to get bodies, in senators' offices, you don't have that same like where you could activate this network of people all over the U.S. because they were all communicating because people aren't involved anymore. Because um, this is sort of a change in how you use it. I quote in the book from an interview I did in 2014 um, as part of my dissertation with um, a trans woman who had actually, when she was 18 and went to college as a computer science major, got on trans Usenet because she was had some cross-gender feelings. She's trying to figure it out. 
she gets on it, looks at it, and she's like, nope, not for me. Like, she, I mean, she didn't have a laptop, but you just imagine her closing it. <laughs> like, nope, mm-mm. Um, and then, but later on, she got active in Reddit. And through Reddit, she like, and like our transgender being like, oh, wait a minute. No, this was me. Um, and this is, at this point now, she's middle-aged. Um, so I, th- I want to say she was in Chicago. Um, and so she decides to go to a local sport group in like the basement of the Unitarian Universalist Church. And she goes there and she realized at 30, she is the youngest person there by far. And she looks around and is like feeling kind of weird about it. And at one point, one of the older women says to her, it's like, well, you know, you young people, you don't need the basement of the church. You have the internet. And she describes that as the moment when the light bulb goes off. She's like, I don't need the church. I have the internet. So she's like, why would I go? I don't seek support this way. I don't feel super comfortable. Um, so this is like this whole change where he was like, yeah, why would I do this? And this is not to say that in-person sport absolutely doesn't matter, but this kind of like traditional sport group model, it's just not the way you do it. Like I think of like, I mentioned the Chicago Gender Society. They're still around. Um, they've been around for years, but in 2018, um, a journalist did a piece in them.us interviewing um interviewing them and i only mentioned this to note is that i can guarantee you based on that piece nobody in that group was under 65 mm-hmm. you know they've been in it forever and they weren't bringing in new members and honestly when those folks pass on that group will probably fall apart because nobody's coming in anymore you don't you don't use that model anymore. Yeah. I'm going to bring it back to platforms because that's my plan. <laughs> but but it's true. And in the book, mm-hmm. Avery actually does write quite a bit about platforms. It's just you, you left mm-hmm. off that the pages tonight. So I have more questions. Um, and I think you write um, really, really well uh, and really deeply about uh, your observations of how hashtags can mm-hmm. oversimplify identity mm-hmm. and how search results can reinforce stereotypes. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, I was going to ask you about your sort of mm-hmm. conclusion around that we need to own our own servers mm-hmm. and have our own spaces. And I guess it got me thinking about like, why do we, why do we put up with platforms in the first place? <laughs> and so I just was mm-hmm. asking, wondering if you could speak a bit more about that. Like, mm-hmm. I wonder what do we trade off with when we, when we say like, we need our own spaces and how might those spaces not mm-hmm. fall into obscurity, right? Mm-hmm. Because if you have your own, websites or servers mm-hmm. or platforms and Google doesn't index them, mm-hmm. <laughs> who's going to find yeah. them? And I and so I guess the bigger question is a lot of what you showed us was around sort of support and mm-hmm. communities connecting with each mm-hmm. other and mm-hmm. having more communication with each other. I'm wondering how much did these different spaces and then in what you're talking about the possibility of platforms mm-hmm. now, how much about of that is about sort of public visibility and all the things we grapple with when we talk mm-hmm. about like visibility mm-hmm. and representation versus like community support and fortifying that counter public? Oh, that's a big question. Why do we put up with platforms? <laughs> Why? Why do we? Um, I think you've, you've drawn that out really well because that is sort of like the ups and downs. We put up with platforms because it makes us more visible. It's just so, and frankly, it's much easier. That was a great innovation of a site like Facebook is you don't have to manually make a web ring. You got to add links and you got to do a click to this, to this. It does all that infrastructure for you. You don't have to build it yourself and how much easier it is. So like, for example, a lot of those homepages, those homepages die off because the live journal comes around and they all go to have journals. Because the live journal is easy. You just you press a button, you've like followed someone, you've friended them. It, the apparatus for connecting is built in with the thing. Um, so I think there is that, like the sort of the trade-off is the ease of use and the sort of like, there's no friction to it. It's like, just like frictionless and it's meant to be frictionless because it keeps you there. And when it's advertising funded, it keeps your eyeballs in front of the ads. Um, but at the same time, I think you're right in terms of what we get is like, yes, it's so easy, but moving away from them is risky too, because it's not as visible. I, um, when I was at the Association of Internet Researchers, I also thought about this in terms of search. I talk about search at the end of the book because a part of one of the interesting things, but if you Google trans stuff, because of particular after 2016 is when I suspect this happened, um, with the way that Google changed the rankings, all of the top stuff are these sort of official organizations. So the APA, 
uh, Wikipedia, um, possibly the National Center for Transgender Equality in the US. Like it's these sort of like big official authorities, which is good in one way. It means that there's not far weird, far right cranks trying to like yank the dials and take it over. At the same time, it means that like those community resources already aren't visible, you know? Um, and this is not to say that all those community resources were great, but like to give an example, in 2014, when I did interviews, one of the ways when I was talking to trans masculine folks or trans men, as like a kind of warm up question, I'd ask them opinions about Hudson's F to M guide, uh, which you are, if you are a trans masculine person of a certain generation, you had opinions about Hudson's. Um, you know, and that was because everybody had gone there because it showed up in search results. Now I talk to my students, they're like, what? Mm -hmm. I'm like, that's fair. How, how would you encounter it? Because it's not this official authoritative source, but at the very least it was something made. You know, you could have opinions because you were talking to another trans person and say, it's like, I'm glad that GLAD has a great definition for trans folks. I don't know, it gets it the weird variability of being trans in like a meaningful way. Um, and certainly like platforms as we encounter them now are not incentivized to show you all that weird variability. Um, Tumblr is the only one that really doesn't do that, but that can also be overwhelming. It's not, it's not specific. Um, and so I think there's, it's not like a great solution, but I think if there are ways in which, if I think like Federation offers a possibility, where you can have separate local control, but it's interconnected in a way that you can find those things. So there's a possibility in Federation, and now I'm going full board nerd. We're not going to talk about Mastodon and shit and like Activity Club. This is not The Verge, but this is that's a joke for like you know for like three nerds. Um, but I think like the idea of having this sort of like small federated control, but also being okay with maybe I have this space. But a lot of me lives in like the Discord server I have with my friends. So I like, I know about this stuff, I'm connected in, but the servers where like this like share, small shared space, that's primarily text based, is where like I connect. Or maybe like I've got, I'm on this like Mastodon server where like, you know, like I'm here with like a bunch of other queer folks and I feel comfortable doing this. And so, but I also feel comfortable knowing that my administrative team is going to make sure that none of this kind of harassment is going to come and get to me. So I'll be visible enough, but I can control some of this for it. So I think there's a lot of possibility in the future. It just sort of depends where we go. And hopefully we just don't end up with threats because that's just like Facebook. I, <laughs> I, just, I already did it once. I only have it because they don't make yellow pages anymore. You know, let's just not repeat Facebook, please. <laughs> Someone online appreciate the bridge joke. <laughs> okay, I'm glad. I just this is it's like for a very specific kind of nerd. Anyone else? Friends. Yeah. Go for it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I really appreciate you like cleaning up this when you know our histories, including mm -hmm. like the histories of the recent past. Mm -hmm. Like like you know, 2001. Yeah. Like, I was there, but like these are these, yeah, it's just mm -hmm. important to know this larger kind of context. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm thinking about that also in relation to what kind of feels like a bit of a generation gap more broadly within mm -hmm. the trans community mm -hmm. and also within like trans from like LGB kind mm -hmm. of communities. Um, like stealing from Laura, who just left, so I get to steal it now. Um, <laughs> we're talking about like where are these heterosexual cross dressers anymore? Mm -hmm. so this is like, you know, problematic mm -hmm. label within the kind of discourse mm -hmm. today. Um, and so I'm wondering how you're kind of thinking about the relationship between technology and this kind of generational divide today? Like, is it a, a media literacy problem? Is it like a, like, I don't know, how, what does that look like? In, you know, yeah. yeah, I think that the technology and that sort of generation gap, it's, it is sort of <clears throat> interesting in about also when that changed, there's also sort of like, there's a different political attitude, but also a different understanding of gender. Um, what's fascinating is that like, so much of the early part of the book is just all like, trans women and heterosexual cross dresses. So many, like, I'm gonna be very facetious, but sort of true. So many middle-class white women with opinions on the internet all together and they're hugely dominant and then they sort of disappear. And I think a part of that is also about like a change in how we understood gender and the way that these folks are approaching gender is just not contemporary. Um, but also frankly, a lot of like, 
if I think about how we write history, now we're getting into historiography um, at this point, is that when we think about trans history, the history of the 80s, which is sort of what, what this is, this is like a history of the 80s and 90s, um, because there are sort of dominant histories that are very, very good, but they do this sort of thing where the only thing that seems to happen in the 80s to trans people is the AIDS crisis. And then we just like bop forward to like queer theory and Netscape. I'm like, stuff happened in between there. And a part of that stuff was just like boring institution building, I think is a part of it. It's like, it's very boring. Like we founded IFG. We argued about what kind of Congress we needed. We found another organization. Like, and then we like set up a committee. This is not exciting. Like, it's not historically exciting. It's not terribly radical, you know, to be like, we built a committee and then we argued about who got to be in the committee. Um, but it's sort of the thing you need to build the capacity to be able to then by 1995 in the United States be lobbying in the halls of Congress. Because all of that stuff gets you up there, but again, it's not super interesting. And it gets a lot of sort of middle class, like folks who notably, one of the things about heterosexual crossdressers too, is that the norm within that community is that you reveal in the archive at least very little about yourself. So a lot of them go by their on femme name, where the thing I sort of talked about at the beginning is, of the book is like, I might quote, I'm just gonna randomly pick a name like Susie. Susie is an author with like, I don't know, Crossport. They were, um, Crossport was based out of Ohio, I think. And, but I don't think a Susie actually exists, but like Susie writes to it, you know, everybody in that group knows who Susie is. They recognize her face, they know a lot about her life, but she writes about none of it because by writing about, she risks outing herself if someone encounters her. So there's this sort of layer upon layer of privacy too, where these people are sort of like, you don't know a lot about them, but you know that they're doing things. Um, so I think that also makes that history kind of harder to approach because there's all these historical actors, but we can't, many of them we can't track down. And at least for me, I don't try to track them down because I'm not sure that they want that, that they want to sort of like, they did all this stuff in the past. And for them, they have a very different attitude toward being out than folks do now. So for them, they might not want me to track them. I'll, I'll give an example from like, so I'm working on this paper about ASA. And I realized I had the name of someone who's writing to CD4 Morning Neon. I started to look for her through Google and I, what I ended up finding was her obituary. Um, but I realized like these moments where I could like, I'm like, I could trace these people back. I could find them. I had this song, like, do I want to try to track her down? But I'm like, no, because I don't know how she's going to feel about this. Be like, this thing that was private once has now become a historical document, and I'm going to go like chase you down and ask you a bunch of questions about this period of your life that I don't know how you feel about it. Um, you know, and so I think that means in some ways, like, the history gets lost because those historical actors aren't there to speak for themselves. They sort of dropped out of the community or how they interacted with the community was not the way that like the youngest and most visible members of the community interact with each other. Um, it's like how I can talk about this talk, like the Society for the Second Self used to be huge in the United States. And I think they had some branches in Canada as well. Um, they had like a chapter in almost every state throughout the 80s and 90s. This is the height of Trias. Um, and now they have five and I, I have not studied all of them, but I guarantee that nobody under 50 belongs to any of those chapters. Because like they've just sort of died off and they've ended because people aren't doing it anymore. And because again, like that's not how you interact with the community. So like you have these like all these sort of patterns of attrition and this kind of alighting that means that you can't engage with those the historical actors and ask them their story because maybe they don't, they don't want to tell it. And like, I said, like, I'm okay with that because I want them to feel like they have their privacy. But yeah, it does mean we lose something. That's why I have a book. I'm like, here's the book. <laughs> I did it for you. Here's, here's some of it at least. I think we have time for one more question. Mm -hmm. Let's take this question. Mm -hmm. um, I was curious when you yeah. mentioned earlier in the presentation, um, mm -hmm. sort of sexually explicit con um, mm -hmm. content that exists on these platforms. Mm -hmm. And that quote that kind of pointed towards kind of what is respectively mm -hmm. this idea that like oh we mm -hmm. do more than just weird sex stuff. Mm -hmm. Um I was wondering like what role did that 
Sex abuse is a common plague early on. Um, and did it kind of disappear because of a sort of push towards other topics of conversation? Were these ways in which people could, you know, find each other? Uh, was that a part of it at all or not? I think this is it's um it's interesting you bring up this is a, I'm not trying to pitch my ASA paper, it's literally <laughs> that I actually got an archive that does deal with it because this was sort of the problem early on with the book. <clears throat> is that because a bunch of these were sort of in semi-public spaces, like that push for respectability was huge. Um early on, sort of like someone described it like <clears throat> Virginia Prince's this figure in trans history cast cast this incredibly long shadow, especially over cross dresses around these norms that like. We are nice middle class ladies who do not do any of that sexy stuff yeah. and we embody perfect femininity. And so it casts this long shadow, even though cross dressers in many invariable relationships to how they thought about gender and presentation. Um, and so that carries over to these spaces and this concern, especially in the cyber poor panic. But when they have full privacy, they definitely talked about it. So like CD4, which is this private mailing list. I mean, Marianne Harmon, who's big in the history of Usenet, donated it to me. She had this archive. Um, and in looking at it in this private space, they talk about it. They talk about how they think about gender in relation to kink and relate to fetish and relation to their own sexuality and how it evolves over time. Frankly, some of them say them bisexual, a thing you are not allowed to say if you're part of Trias. You are a heterosexual who wants to get married, please. Um, so they talk about all of this stuff, but because they have that kind of privacy and they feel safe. Um, and so sort of like, there's always a sort of distance from this stuff publicly, but in some of these smaller spaces, they absolutely did, but we don't really have like archives of those. Cause in some ways they were also meant to combust because if you saved it, it put you at risk, you know? So they're like, we want to get it out, but we don't want anyone else to see it because like that could be a risk. Um, so that's why I suspect in person, a lot of these conversations happened at meetings, but we don't have a record of those meetings, so we don't really know. But I suspect like a lot of this in-person, a lot of this stuff happened in person at like meetings and conferences, and it's just nobody recorded it. And so we don't have an official record of it. Mm -hmm. Oh, I mean, maybe we can have some like time to linger if people have like other mm -hmm. questions, but it's because our capture is almost at time. <laughs> um, but thank you all so much for coming, and then we can have some more mm -hmm. later if you want. Um, thank you so much for your amazing talk. Yeah. Um, and also uh, come to the Queer Books Party, LGBTQ Books Party from 6 to 8 on Saturday, where we some free food. Mm -hmm. It'll be great. Um, and uh, yeah, and join us on the 15th for our talk about uh, how death is online and with technology. So yeah, awesome. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.